married 49 years. 47 of them are happy. Those first two are kind of rough. Okay, so we've been married a long time. And she knows that I can't find squat. Okay, so the intrinsic value of a woman is she can find anything that a man cannot find. All right, because, you know, you're looking straight at it. You know, there's a, even a meme out there about uh, this guy is uh, saying, hey, honey, where's the ketchup? And in the refrigerator, there it is right in front of him, and he can't find it. On the other hand, he can see a deer off three miles in Montana, you know, because he's, you know, that's what he, he's, that's what he's looking for. That's what he's good at. All right, so what are the, what's the value of men and women? Well, it's the same, except that it's different. Now, there's five passages, if we can get to them tonight, that have to do with the restriction of the role of women. All right, um, yeah, are you ready? All right, so get your Bibles out. This is You, you know I don't have a PowerPoint, so you're going to have to use your Bibles. All right, because um, I'm going to do this uh, as best I can remember. And, and they are 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1st Titus chapter 2 1st Timothy chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 5 those four are by Paul and then Peter writes 1st Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 so five of them in the New Testament that restrict the role of women come from uh, four from Paul and, and one from Peter now that has led some of the modern thinkers to think that Paul was a misogynist Misao is the Greek word for hate, and gune is the Greek word for woman. So a misogynist is a person who hates women. Therefore, it was even said at a youth rally in Nashville by one of our guys at one of our universities, not Fried Hardeman, that the Apostle Paul got two things wrong. He was wrong about slavery, and he was wrong about women. Now let me just say, I'd be very careful. I'd want to line my, uh, I'd want to put a lightning rod on my casket if I ever said something like that to a group of people. Why is that? Because he said the Apostle Paul was wrong about two things. Now if he's wrong about these things, then what makes him right about other things? And by what standard do you decide whether or not apostolic writers were wrong or right if you're going to say they were wrong about these things? So I'm just going to say, if I ever say that, I will have lost my mind and please ask me to go find it. I will have lost my mind if I ever say the Apostle Paul was wrong about anything. All right, so the Apostle Paul then himself is not a hater of women. As a matter of fact, you will see that he elevates the role of women in a number of places, like 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when he says that a woman's uh, sexual uh, attraction, she has the same right of sexual fulfillment that a man does. And, and, you know, and yet at that time, it would have been thought that a man is completely in charge of that because he's the head of the house. And the Apostle Paul says, no, a woman has the right to this just like a man does. In 1 Corinthians 7, what I call the smallest marriage manual in the New Testament in verses 1 through 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So let's get on to the five passages. All right, the first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, I don't have any specific order of these. It's just how I happen to remember them. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, notice that Paul is talking about, uh, he's answering questions from the household of Chloe. So I teach, I used to teach my students, I'm retired now, I don't teach any, anybody. Okay, and besides that on the internet, that's not real teaching. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, we find this going on with Paul, and I call this uh, Chloe's laundry list, because from the household of Chloe, they send him a, loop, a group of questions, and then he's, and then he's going to answer these questions, right? So apparently a lot of those have to do with worship and stuff and you will find that with regard to worship and stuff that's especially uh, chapter uh, uh, chapters 11 through 14 where Paul deals with these questions about women and about worship and, and all that kind of stuff. Now the way that he starts this out is a really important way because notice there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 he starts now I commend you because you remember me in everything uh, and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is a man and the head of Christ is God. Now this translation that I'm using here is generally good. It's not good right here because it changes it from man to husband and from woman to wife. And this is the ESV, which is a very good translation. It's the one I usually use. I just don't like this rendering here. Why? Because there are not different words for woman and 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 wife in the Bible. That's the same word, gune. Same word. You have to tell by context whether or not it's a woman or whether or not it's a 
wife. There's one word for man, uh, generically. All right, so if you're talking about this word, is it different if you're talking about a husband and an heir as opposed to a man who's also an heir? The answer is no, it's the same thing. So how do you tell if it's a wife or a woman? How do you tell if it's a man or a husband? Three very important points here. Context, context, and context. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians 11, is Paul saying here that the head of, okay, if he's talking about the fact that Christ is the head of man, is Christ only the head of husbands? So why did they switch from, from men to husbands? And I think it was a political thing. Because basically in the context, once you get on this horse, you need to ride it. So if you start out and that word means man, then it should mean man in the rest of that immediate context. If you start out with woman, then it should mean woman in the rest of that context. So I believe that you will find it right in other translations that say the head of the woman is the man, and the, head of the man is Christ, the head of Christ is God. And that would be the authority structure that is the first thing that Paul wants them to understand. With regard to, okay, what is the, what is the flow of information and, and who's in charge here? And he just tells you that, that, and that. Now another thing in, for, about 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and you could view this as a separate passage if you want to, but I'm not going to view it as a separate passage. Okay, so if you jump down here, we are not going to talk about the head coverings right now. But go down to verse 11 of chapter 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For a woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Okay, and therefore he's doing this in order to justify why women should wear a sign of submission in church if indeed they're in a culture where there is a sign of submission. Now, we used to have a sign of submission because women would get dressed wearing white, which meant not only that she was pure, but that she was willing to be subject to her husband. And there are other signs of submission that we sometimes have had. The veil, to a lot of people, maybe to your grandmamas, used to mean, okay, I'm going to understand that he's the head of the house. Now, my mother would put it this way. That my daddy was the head of the house, but she was the neck, and the neck could turn the head whichever way she wanted it to go. All right, so whenever you think about it, however, we understand that here in 1 Corinthians 11, there is an authoritative reason of why the women should wear something to cover their heads with, and the men didn't have to. All right, so why is that? Well, because the woman was made from the man. You see that order of, of creation argument there? Uh, a man was first made, and then a woman, and then a woman was made from man. Adamah is the Hebrew word for it. It means a helper. So he was first made, and then she was made. Were they both made in the image of God? Yes. But was she made subsequent to Adam? Yes, she was. On the same day. So what we see then is that this order of our, what's called order of creation, this order of creation argument is used in 1 Corinthians 11. Now we're going to see it again. All right, now let's jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we now see a, a very famous passage, verses 34 and 35, about the fact that a woman is to remain silent in church. What does that mean? She can't breathe, wheeze, uh, snort, whistle, give the good confession, she can't sing, what? You know, does that mean she's got to be absolutely silent? Because that's what that word means, sagao. It doesn't mean that she needs to be submissively quiet. It means she's supposed to shut up. Now in 1 Corinthians 14, let's put that in context. Because he also told, tells two other people to shut up. He tells if there's somebody who is, um, let's say, if you're having somebody who is tongue speaking and another one receives the gift, then he says to the first one, shut up. Hush. Sit down. God is not the, the author of confusion, but of peace, verse 40. There's not going to be that kind of stuff going on in, in my worship services. So you hush. Now you know uh, what that means. Hush to my mom and dad. My mother never could count. You know, some parents today count to 10. If I ever got to 10, I was dead. Okay, so you, that my mother and dad never counted because you just knew that if they said to do it, well, then you just do it or you would surely die. Okay, so what you do is you just do it. Now, with regard to this, the idea of hushing is, now you hush. 
Now the other group is, what if somebody has a revelation from God, and then another person over here has a revelation from God, then again, you're supposed to hush. Now there's two groups that have already been told to hush prior to verses 34 and 35. In verses 34 and 35, it says now, okay, so what does it say? Well, a woman is to remain silent in the church. Well, what does that mean? If she's to hush in church, can she sing? Can she, when she's baptized, say anything? Can a woman say amen? You ever been to churches where the women could talk to? Well, I've preached to several of them. And let me just tell you, you know, if you're preaching at one of those congregations where they talk to you, you know whether or not they're with you because they're still talking to you. And you know how they're not with you? Well, they're no longer talking to you. So that led me to believe, you know, how if you're preaching, for instance, to a predominantly black congregation, they talk to you, right? And you can tell whether or not you got it. Well, how can you tell if you preach to a white audience? And I don't think you can tell. Okay, because you know, we look about the same. All right, so with regard to this then, all right, so can a woman say amen? Sure. Can a woman say so be it? Sure. Is that violating anybody? I mean, is only the man supposed to say anything in church? Brethren, this is in the context of the, of the exercise of miraculous spiritual gifts. It's talking about whether or not women should be speaking up with tongue speaking, whether or not they should be speaking up as, as prophets before the entire church and all that kind of stuff. And he tells them to be silent. Now he doesn't tell them to be absolutely totally silent in every area, but in this area right here, he tells them to be silent. All right, so in the area of the miraculous exercise of spiritual gifts, you might say, well, we don't have miraculous spiritual gifts anymore, so that means that we're open, right? That women can do whatever a man can do because a woman has been redeemed. Now, let's say that a woman is at this point in her life here and she's been redeemed. And where she first lost that redemption was Genesis 3.16, according to the argument. Uh, because Eve, her desire shall be to her husband, right? Genesis 3.16. So they think, okay, so if a woman today is redeemed, that means she's bought back and put in the very position she was in before she sinned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3.16. That's where the argument goes. What's wrong with that? Well, and he right. Paul doesn't argue that. He doesn't argue go back to this moment. He says go back to creation. Not the fall, but creation. The woman was made from the side of the man. Creation. Creation. So in 1 Corinthians 14, there is a, a passage there that I don't really know for sure what it means. I have some ideas. As the law also says in verse 35. Well, what is the law? Well, is Paul talking about Genesis 3.16 or is he talking about Genesis 1, 26 and 27? And he doesn't say. So it's a possible way of looking at the fall, of, of saying that it was not the fall, but it was the creation. Now let me show you a very clear place where it definitely is the creation. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and this will be our third passage. So we've kind of glanced at 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians 14. Now let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now it starts out, um, again, Paul likes to do this by setting the authority out first and then talking about the things that you can understand better if you understand the authority. By the way, that's not unlike us. We're the same way. If we understand what the authority is, somebody says, by the way, I'm in charge. Well, they may or may not be in charge, but you look at the Bible and you see, are they in charge? And the answer, if the answer is yes, well, then they're in charge. All right, so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, here's how it starts. Now in verse 8, we find a reference there to men can lift up hands everywhere, holy hands, which is probably a metonymy for praying. A man can pray everywhere, in the assembly, outside of the assembly. Men can pray everywhere. And by the way, this is not talking about husbands. It's talking about men. I want men everywhere. Men everywhere can do this. 
But then, in contrast to that, Kevin, why did you lose your billboard? I got used to seeing your ugly face driving to Jackson, and your billboard's not. Are you cheap? You know, did you did you get rid of that billboard? Well, there, there, no, there's some woman's picture up there, and I'm just kind of thinking you lost your place. What? Well, I'm going to talk about something else. I, so, <laughs> so, anyway, I'm just telling you, I have noticed the fact that your picture is not up there. All right, so so here's here's what I'm thinking then about 1 Timothy 2. Now the men can do this everywhere, but the women. That's verse 9. The women now should adorn themselves in modest apparel. Now the word modest there means um, orderly, appropriate, in place as in the natural order of things. You cannot, over the years, I, I've retired from Fried Hardeman, I've heard so many discussions among faculty and students about how short, you know, too short pants were. What are you going to do with leggings? What are you going to do with yoga pants? Or other pants that you can basically read through. Okay, what are you going to do about this kind of stuff? And is it immodest? Because you cannot come up with 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9 with exact rules about that. Except for this rule. Now if a woman is committed in her heart to the Lord, then her dress will be appropriate, modest, appropriate. If she is committed to the Lord, then her dress will be appropriate. By the way, there's no reason why that also would not apply to a man. Because women can also lust. Alright, so if you are committed to the Lord in your heart, then your dress should be appropriate, verse 9. But notice, he's talking about men are able to pray everywhere, and then all of a sudden he switches to the fact that the women need to be submissive. Now why do that? Unless it means something. And then he says, beginning in verses 12 through 15, it gives you a reason why. He tells you, matter of fact, somebody read this so I won't have to look it up. Who's got it? This is a Bible class and it's not a sermon. Read it, somebody. 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 12 through 15. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing. They continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, I have a person who I'm thinking of with a PhD in Greek, and he was saying, he finally came to the conclusion that there was no order of creation argument in 1 Timothy 2. Wow. Look at it. Does it look like there's an order of creation argument in 1 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 12? Does it look like it to you? Do you think somebody would have to use some real creative interpretation in order to try to get that away? By the way, that guy's no longer a member of the Church of Christ. And he used to teach at two graduate schools in the Churches of Christ that I know of. He's not even among us anymore because he reached the conclusion that a woman can do whatever a man can do in church because that is not an order of creation argument in 1 Timothy 2. If it's not, how much clearer could Paul have been? than to say, for the woman was not the first created, but the man, and therefore she should be hesikonzo, which does not mean to be silent, like the 1 Corinthians 14 passage, it means to be submissive. So, a woman should be submissive in her teaching and her relationship with the men. Now, is this one talking about in the church? Well, you tell me. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, and tell me if Paul's talking about stuff that relates to church stuff. He says, now, I'm hoping to come to you shortly, Timothy, but if I cannot... I just want you to know this. I want you to know how to behave yourself in the house of God. Does that sound like church stuff to you? I want you to know how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So what Paul is saying has to do with church stuff. 
Now, sometimes people say, well, then are you saying then that a husband and wife cannot pray together? Well, is that church stuff? And besides that, if you want to apply that to a husband and wife praying together, then may a husband and wife be unclothed together. I'm saying this as delicately as I can. In circumstances in their marital life. Can I say that any other way so as not to get in trouble? Okay, must a woman always be modestly clothed even when she's with her husband in their own home? Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about in the church. In the church. In the church. May a husband and wife pray together in their own family? That is up to you. There is nothing in the Bible that would forbid that. Matter of fact, I have four daughters, and I would even recommend that you allow them to pray at the table to hear what they have to say to God. Because I think it is not in any violation of 1 Timothy 2 because it is not the church. But some things are the church. And with regard to these things, Paul said, Now women, this is not in the context of just miraculous spiritual gifts. This is carte blanche with regard to church stuff. And that is, be submissive. Well, okay. Does that mean that a woman can't do anything in the church? No. One time my daughter was told no when she asked, was asked if she could run the PowerPoint. And I didn't understand that then, and I still don't. Just because you're an elder doesn't mean that you're always smart. You know, why in the world would you say that a girl cannot run the PowerPoint for church? Sometimes we have these ideas, and we just have a difficult time getting out of them, of what is or is not a leadership role. So if it is truly something that has to do with inherent leadership, like elder, deacon, preacher, of course, these must be men. But there are a lot of other areas where, for instance, we sometimes close out women from being on certain committees, which they really need to be on. Because they have insights that a lot of other people don't have, and we need to hear what they have to say. Number four, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Um, my wife would like for us to start with verse 21, but a lot of people think that we'll start with verse 22, so let's go back to verse 21. Actually, verse 21 is the conclusion of the idea that Paul's talking about where he uses a series of ing words we call them gerunds there are five of them that he uses uh, beginning in in verse 19 through 21 there's actually five of them you know we talk a lot about acapella singing from, from Ephesians 5:19 that's really a sub point of the text i think you can get it from there but that's not his main point his main point is that this is what Christians do. Christians are filled with the Spirit. Christians give thanks to one another. Christians are subject to one another. Christians sing. You know, and so when we think about those kind of things, that ends in verse 21. And that is, therefore, submitting one another as, as unto the Lord. However, I would say that that thought can go into verse 22. Well, why is it important? Well, because a husband, a wife is not supposed to submit herself to her husband if he's telling her to do ungodly things. Her first submission is to Christ. So if he says, if, if he says to her, do X, and X happens to be something that is not right, she is not under obligation to do it. Why? Because her first submission is to the Lord. Okay, so you both are under submission to the Lord. And then, for the, as the husband is the head of the wife, so Christ is the head of the church, beginning in verse 22. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, etc., etc. And then he talks about various ways that we should love ourselves. I don't know if I can remember all three of them. But there are three things here that husbands need to hear in, in Ephesians chapter 5. 
You should love your wife like Jesus loved the church. You should love your wife like you love yourself. You should love your wife like you love your own body and get over this narcissism, egotistical stuff that sometimes kills marriages. A man wants to do what a man wants to do and he doesn't want to listen to anything that the woman has to do. I'm going to tell you in Ephesians chapter 5, any man who does that is not covered by this passage. Not covered by this passage. Why? Because sometimes we are so focused on ourselves that we don't even think about our spouse. I know preachers that are so involved in the church... And it's like, I'm sure you've heard that old tale about the cobbler's children have no shoes. Well, that's the way it is with some, some preachers who spend so much time with the church and then their own family goes wanting and, and, and they can't take it back. So make sure that you don't do that, that you put it all in balance. But he does say, however, that the husband is the head of the wife. And I don't think that that is passed out of significance. I don't think that it's gone away. I still think that it is true that the husband is to be the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Is even backed up in Titus chapter 2 where Paul talks about roles. And he says, um, now I want to talk to you about sound doctrine in Titus 2 and verse 1. And then he says, now here is the sound doctrine I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the fact that men are sometimes not very lovable. And women, let me talk to you as older women talking to the younger women. Let me talk to you about how you try to keep from, you know, doing something bad to your husband when he's not very lovable. I want to talk to you about that. And older men, I want to talk to you about being mentors for younger men. And show them the way. Don't just tell them the way. But show them the way to do that. Now that's all in, in the context of roles as well. Because all of our roles are not equal. One of the weird things about retiring at Fried Hardman, like I did, is number one, I, I couldn't get in the classroom the last day of my retirement. And number two, I was serving under a guy who was a former student, David Shannon. And I was thinking, how wrong is this? You know, I, you know that I, this, this squirt who was in my class, you know, is now president and now I am subject to him. Now, is he inferior to me? Not in any way you can think of. Am I inferior to him? Not in any way you can think of. Does he have a different role than I do? Oh, of course. He is the only, actually, according to the Board of Trustees, he is the only person employed by the Board of Trustees and given the responsibility to hire the faculty. He's the only one. Okay, so what's Ephesians 5 about? Women, uh, submit to your husbands, but not to the point that you lose your submission to Christ. And have the sort of attitude that uh, will want him, allow him to put him where he needs to be. I always mess with the Walmart people where it says consultation here. So I'll ask them stuff like, what do you do to make your children love you and that kind of stuff. Okay, and so, you know, when I, so Lisa at the Walmart in, in Jackson. So I said, so Lisa, what do I do to keep my wife happy? And, and she said, without a blink, she says, do everything that she says and don't fuss about it. And so, so I, I think that there is some advice to that. They're listening to what your wife has to say. But on the other hand, do remember, men, you are the spiritual leader of the family. The only reason why a woman should be the spiritual leader of your family is if you refuse to do it. And if you refuse to do it, then she'll have to step in. Number five. 1 Peter chapter 3. Alright, let's read verses 1 through 5. Robert, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Okay, so Sarah was submissive to her husband, Abraham, and called him Lord. So a lot of men are, are disappointed whenever their husband won't call him Lord. Okay, uh, the word Lord, by the way, covers uh, several nuances of meaning in the, in the Bible. Uh, for instance, when, when Saul says to Jesus on the road to Damascus, Who are you, Lord? If he already knew that he was Lord, why is he saying, Who are you? Why didn't he just say, Lord, my God? But he didn't. He said, Who are you, Lord? As in a term of respect. So Lord can mean a term of respect, and it can mean as in the Lord God. In this case, Sarah called her husband Lord, which doesn't communicate well in a 21st century context. So a, a better way of saying that might be to this generation is, make sure that you respect your husband, because not only is it good for you and your family, but if you don't do it, you're going to disqualify him from a number of things. You know, it's going to be difficult for him to be an elder or a deacon if you're not like this. And besides that, if you're a preacher, it's like this. When I was a young preacher, uh, it was in the 70s. And it was very important then that you make your children mind. You know what I mean? You had to make your children mind. I mean, mind. And if you snapped your finger... They'd stop doing it. If you say jump, they'd say how far. It was important. Then we had a child. Okay? And then we learned about children. There's something of an independent spirit about them. And they don't always do exactly as you would have in mind. Matter of fact, our youngest grandson is two years old. <laughs> and she was FaceTiming last night when he was in the tub. And then he got out of the tub. And then he had a, a whole bucket of toys. And she just says, don't pour the, don't, don't go ahead and pour those out. <laughs> okay. <I don't, laughs> it's, like, it's all right. It's just toys. <laughs> just dump them out. That's fun. But on the other hand, if your children know that you're serious and you really say something, it's important for them to respect you with regard to what you have said. You might also have seen in some stores, uh, like a big, like a Walmart or something, you might have seen such an authority struggle between the little kids and their mom and dad. And she or he will say, now you're not getting that. And then they go into a flying hissy. And then the whole store begins to gather around to watch. You know, and then it's just kind of like, now they're taking bets on who's going to win. Is it going to be the two-year-old or is it going to be a mama or daddy? <laughs> well, let me just say that if I ever had done that to my parents one time, that would have been the last time that I ever would have thought about doing it. Now, why? It is not just a question of old generation versus young, but does your child respect you? Does your child honor you? And at some point they're brought up without respect for authority altogether, then the rest of the society has to pay because you haven't taught them to respect you as a mother or father. Now, there are your five passages. And in all these five passages, we learn something that did not die in the first century. A lot of uh, churches that I'm thinking of uh, are reevaluating the role of women. And uh, I guess it's beginning more in, in large cities. Uh, I know about a new book that's coming out uh, that's saying that a woman can be an egalitarian. In other words, she can do whatever a man can do. I know of another book that's coming out where a guy is saying, hey, wait a minute, let's not trash these five passages here. 
How are you just going to wave a magic wand and make them all disappear? I mean, how can you just do that? Because they are part of the Bible, and besides that, a lot of them are, are grounded in stuff that happened in the Old Testament. So, what shall happen? Well, what I've tried to do uh, tonight is to give you a survey of the five passages, places to look for your own study, and places for you to look to see whether or not what you've been taught about this from a conservative standpoint is indeed what the Bible says. And if it is indeed what the Bible says, then do it. See, here's part of the problem. It's not just about Confederate statues or protests and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's not just about unrest in white communities or black communities or Hispanics or all that kind of stuff. What the world is really suffering from is a loss of respect for the authority of God. Now, your generation as a whole, I'm talking to those of you who are much younger than me. I don't do Starbucks. If you do Starbucks, why pay $6 for a cup of coffee? You can buy a shirt for that. Okay, you know, or why do Panera Bread? You're going to be hungry 20 minutes later. Okay, so I'm from a different generation. And this generation Y, as they are called, uh, is not very tolerant of lessons about the authority of God. So what we have to do, it seems to me, is to teach the same stuff without using the word authority. I mean, can we teach the same thing that the Bible says and use terms that are not offensive to them so that they will understand, hey, this is really just about pleasing God, you know? Everything that we do in life is really just about pleasing God. I mean, that's why we do the Lord's Supper on Sunday, and that's why we do the Lord's Supper every Sunday. That's why we sing a cappella. I mean, that's what God said He wanted. I mean, if you give Him what He wants and you try to please God with a good and open heart, well, that's what He wants. I don't know what your circumstance is tonight. But if you have been baptized, I hope at that time what you were saying to yourself is, I'm going to go to hell if I don't do this. But hopefully you were thinking, this is what God wants me to do. And I'm hoping that that's the reason why you're here tonight. This is what God wants me to do. While we stand and sing.